So what we're gonna do is we're going to do an ultrasound of the bladder, first of all, and we're gonna see after they went to the bathroom, how much urine is left behind. Now you can measure that with a catheter directly and we will do that sometimes, but if we can, we prefer to do um, an ultrasound because it's non-invasive. Nobody really wants a catheter. Um, so we'll see if the bladder is emptying well. If it's not emptying well, that's an indication that something's going on here. I'm Dr. Christy. Thank you for listening to the Christy MD podcast. I have a wellness clinic, medical spa, and urogynecology practice in Houston, Texas. Today, I would like to speak to you about robotic bladder lift. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. I hope that you will like this uh, video or podcast, that you'll subscribe, and that you will hit the bell so that you'll be notified whenever I drop new content. Okay, so let's dive in. Who needs a robotic bladder lift? So the patients that need a robotic bladder lift come into me with what is called prolapse. Prolapse is simply a fancy term for a vaginal hernia. What happens is over time, we have in our pelvic area, as women, we have an opening in the muscles and the bones, which is designed to allow the birth of children. Those muscles and ligaments and connective tissue have to hold up all the organs in our body. What happens after childbirth or with aging or collagen issues is that all begins to stretch out over time. The connective tissue stretches out, the muscles stretch out, and the organs are not as supported as they once were. So patients will come into me and they will let me know that they feel pressure in their pelvic area. They may feel a ball in the area where coming out of their vagina, which is simply the vaginal wall sort of protruding out instead of being pulled in like a tube as it should be. They may feel their uterus coming out and they feel uncomfortable. They feel it rubbing. They feel a fullness. They feel it when they're sitting. Now, some women with prolapse do not present feeling this pressure and feeling the fullness there. They feel um, symptoms of the prolapse that affects their function. They feel overactive bladder, bladder leakage, or difficulty having a bowel movement where they feel the stool getting stuck in a pocket down there. It's getting stuck in that hernia. Now, prolapse is rarely something that is um, an urgent, emergent problem that can happen, but that is very rare for it to get to that point. It's something that happens usually very slowly, and it affects the function of the body in a very slowly progressive or insidious manner. So what can happen over time, if it's not addressed, is the bladder can become progressively more and more dysfunctional. The bowels become more and more dysfunctional. They don't like that new situation. They're not gonna function normally. The bladder can begin to retain urine and not empty all the way. It can have a kink in the system where the urine can't all get out and that stagnant urine sits there and just becomes infected. And then the patient becomes chronically infected, uncomfortable, miserable, and sometimes it can even progress to a kidney infection, which can even go on to sepsis. So it can eventually become quite serious. But usually when patients come in, it's not to that point. Um, they catch it ahead of time. And ideally, we want to repair it before it ever gets to that point. So let's talk about um, how do we diagnose it? So when a patient comes in with these complaints, any kind of complaint actually with bladder function 
or bowel function or definitely definitely if they feel pressure. Um, what I do is I do a very thorough history. I ask them very pointed questions about their function, how often they're going to the bathroom day and night, how much they're leaking, what triggers the leak. Is it a cough, a sneeze, or is it just running water or just got to go all of a sudden? I ask them about their bowel habits. Ask them about what kind of fluids that they drink. Are they drinking a lot of caffeine that could be making their bowel, their bladder not function normally? And we talk about their surgeries that they've had, their childbirth and what that was like. We also talk about their sexual function. Now, prolapse doesn't typically cause sexual dysfunction, but some women it does. Some women do feel very uncomfortable. They feel things shifting around during intercourse or the tissues have become very thinned out from menopause and that can make it even more uncomfortable. So after we do this thorough history and I review um, their medications and everything else going on with them, then we're going to proceed to a thorough physical examination focused on the urogynecological organs. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an ultrasound of the bladder, first of all, and we're going to see after they went to the bathroom, how much urine is left behind. Now you can measure that with a catheter directly, and we will do that sometimes. But if we can, we prefer to do um, an ultrasound because it's non-invasive. Nobody really wants a catheter. Um, so we'll see if the bladder is emptying well. If it's not emptying well, that's an indication that something's going on here. Um, then we'll go on to the urogynecologic exam. And what I will do, it's very similar to when you go to a gynecologist. Um, I will look at the condition of the tissues and check the vaginal pH levels. That's a good indicator of how much menopause has um, affected the vaginal walls and thinned them out because when they're very thin, they're not healthy, they don't have a healthy microbiome and the pH is off balance. Then I'm gonna move on to checking for prolapse. I use half of a speculum. A speculum is the device that we put in the vagina to kind of spread it open. Well, I just take half. So it's just kind of like, you know, a little thing to push down each wall or push up that wall so I can, I can really clearly identify what is causing the bulge, what's dropping. And then I do a manual examination. I check the muscles. I check the, uh, if they still have a uterus. I check if the uterus seems to be loose. Um, and then we check how strong the muscles are. I'm looking at the opening of the vagina, how, how tight or gaping it is, um, and just the overall condition of the organs and um, the muscles. So um, the next step is typically if I do find a prolapse and it's graded on a scale of zero to four. So zero would be um, no children and everything is in perfect position. Four um, is when things are coming out past the vaginal opening. So when they sometimes it's just sitting out there all the time and sometimes it's only when they push it out, it'll come out past the vaginal opening. That's a grade four. Usually patients are a grade three when they start to notice it. Sometimes a grade two can be very noticeable, especially if they have a dry, thin vagina. So once we, I, I diagnose exactly what's going on, the next step typically is we discuss the options. Now, if, there's, um, if they are a good surgical candidate um, and they're interested in surgery, then we will definitely start planning that because there's no reason to delay. You can delay. Observation is a very appropriate, um, a very appropriate uh, decision to make when someone has prolapse. Um, I don't think you have to have surgery, but it should be monitored. And if the function begins to decline, then it's like let's get let's just get this fixed now. You know, there's no need to let this progress any further than it should. So if we're going towards surgery, the next step would be to do a urodynamics test. And that's a bladder function test that we do in the office. And it helps me prepare for surgery, helps me anticipate potential problems and uh, cut them off at the cut them off at the pass, you know, get it taken care of all at one surgery. So let's go and talk about the surgery for a few minutes. The robotic bladder lift has been around for probably about 15, 20 years now. Um, and um, I've been doing it myself for the past 
12 years, I've done every kind of bladder lift that there is. And I am absolutely impressed with the robotic bladder lift. Um, if I ever need to have a bladder lift, this is the one that I want to have because it is um, extremely safe in good hands and it's a very effective. The results are very durable. Um, in the thousands of patients that I've done, I think there's only been a handful that had to have it redone. Um, and the complication rate is very, very low. It's done with four small incisions in the abdominal cavity. So, or the abdominal wall, I should say. So on the anterior abdomen, there's usually one right around the belly button. There's two on the left side of the belly button and one on the right side of the belly button. And what I can do is I can put my instruments in um, and then the robotic technology simply comes in because it allows me to control the instruments very precisely. It's sort of like augmented control because I'm still controlling everything, but it just gives me more precision. It also gives me 3D vision. So when I'm doing the surgery, I'm looking through a large console uh, with eyepieces and the technology of the camera, it has two uh, two camera heads so that it gives you 3D vision. So you can see really, really clearly. It's as if I am inside that patient's abdomen using my hands to sew everything up. Now, what I do, it takes me a, a good couple hours to do this because um, the setup takes a while and then um, it takes a while sometimes to dissect the tissues. And what I do is I I separate the vagina away from the surrounding organs, so away from the bladder, away from the rectum. I isolate the vagina, and then I attach a graft to the vagina. This graft is called polypropylene mesh. It is uh, very safe. Polypropylene is the same material that heart surgeons use to sew up the coronaries. So you know, if they're using it in the heart, it has to be safe. It's not going to be rejected by the body or cause an allergic reaction. So it's woven into a very soft, lightweight mesh that I can then attach to the vagina and pull the vagina back up into place where it's supposed to be. And what holds it in place is that there, it's like a Y. It's called a Y graft. So it's got the two, the two parts that attach on the vagina, and then it's got a tail that attaches on the sacral promontory, which has some ligaments in the back of the pelvis. And what it does is it just puts the vagina right back where it belongs and provides a nice, secure support for the vagina. Then what I do is I cover over, I stitch the tissues over the mesh so that the bowels that are in the abdominal cavity cannot touch that mesh. I don't want the bowels to touch it because they'll stick to it. They'll stick to it and then they'll get, they'll get um, twisted. So I cover it all up so it just looks smooth and even. And then I put the bowels back where they belong. And what we find is um, almost 100% cure rate. Um, if someone is not 100% cured, maybe they have just a little bit of prolapse, but not enough that it would bother them. Very rarely, I've had someone come back where I had to do a little bit of vaginal tucking to um, just adjust it slightly. But that's it. And then I put in a what's called an on cue pain pump which delivers local anesthetic into the pelvic cavity for two days. And most of my patients report very little pain from this procedure. And most of my patients go home the same day and without a catheter, urinating just fine. Um, and they have to try to remember to take it easy for a few weeks while they're healing because they do feel pretty good after about a week back to normal. So that is a robotic bladder lift. Um, it is an amazing um, amazing technology. And I'm just thankful that we live in this era that God has opened up our minds to this incredible technology that we th literally, this is, if you could go back a hundred years from now and tell someone I can make four little openings in your abdominal cavity and fix your problem, then that would be a miracle, right? So we're very blessed and I give God the glory and I pray that you will be blessed. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.